Now, uh, is there, now if, you're, if you're in the profession, you're going to sit there thinking, did this thing work? Is there an evidence base? But the answer is yes, there is. It does work. We've carried out research over a period of years. I've given you a reference here. Um, there's a research paper, uh, Dwali and Silver, published uh, in 2004 in uh, OPO, um, which shows that adults can make their own eyewear uh, with good accuracy. Um, but actually, what it shows is in the paper. And if you really want to know how well this works, look at the paper. And very recently, we've um, carried out a um, clinical trial funded by the World Bank in Washington, D.C., on myopic teenagers. And somewhat to our surprise, um, and that's also that, um, the, uh, here to um, Al, there's a paper which is already available on the internet uh, in ophthalmology, which shows that actually myopic teenagers can also make their own eyewear with good accuracy. And um, this, this slide here shows you, it, it's a comparison of um, self-refraction with um, subjective, uh, high quality subjective refraction. You can see the agreement looks quite good. The remarkable thing about this study, uh, there have been three studies, two in, uh, there have been three sites studied, two in China and um, one in inner city Boston. And um, the remarkable result is that the, this slide shows a comparison of the acuity before and after self-refraction. And um, the result, I have to summarize the result. I've only got half a minute left. So uh, something like 95% of myopic teenagers can make their own eyewear accurately enough to uh, get very good um, acuity in the classroom. Um, this technology is in its infancy. There's only about 40,000 of these in use in about 20 countries. Um, but it, and there's a, if, you look on our, um, if you look on our internet site, www.vdw.ox.ac.uk, you will see a little interactive map showing where they are all deployed. And, um, there is no reason why this technology should not be applied to bring vision correction to about a billion people uh, by the year 2020, and that is my personal aim. I have a number of questions and answers, but I think I've run out of time. Okay, I've finished. Josh, we can, we can clap now, I think. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to turn to Andy first. Um, would you like to see a pair? Can we pass me your, the one yeah. you made? Uh, yeah, about these ones you made. Oh, um, they all—they all. You really want? You should try these. Here, hand these out. I was told off. And I was told I mustn't bribe you by leaving. No, no, we don't mind each. being bribed. Well, everyone. Can do they try. come in different frames? Can uh, you get they will do. Vivian, I'm afraid well, they're not. I as... wanted to. One thing I want. I'm, I'm going to run over my time because I, there's one thing I wanted to say which I didn't say. Right, currently, those glasses look a bit funny, but. Over the next six months or so, they're going to look like this, okay? They, did, they do look a bit clunky, but you can expect to see self-adjusting eyewear, which is in a frame a bit like this, and you'll see it over about the next six months. Sorry, I ran off. Andy, your question or comment. Well, you look like Doc Warner. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. I, I, I see about hundreds of people pitching their ideas and I see loads of ideas every single year and I rarely get as excited as I have actually just trying this on now. My question to you is you, you've had this product ready in a format that could be scaled up since 2004-ish. Why haven't you managed to exploit this so that there are a billion out there at the moment? Why are we only on 40,000? Very good question. You'll need um, to get to the microphone. Yeah, very good question. I, um, what I, I decided that rather than um, take this early device through to volume, I would set up a company and I would create a next generation device. And actually I did that. And the next generation device, uh, it went a bit slow and it didn't really get to, um, hasn't yet got to production, but we did in fact license an application of the technology 
to a private equity firm in America for a really rather large amount of money, and I actually retired. Um, I, I retired. I retired to the south of France, um, all of which is true. And then, and then some people came along to me and they said, hold on a minute, aren't, aren't you uh, correcting IWA in the developing world? And I said, well, yeah. And so they said, well, do it then. So I've sort of come back to do it. Is that an answer? Ish. Ish. Bruce, your comment or question? <clears throat> I'm, I'm intuitively attracted to the idea. So you have a couple of syringes which inject water into the eyepieces and create the refractive difference. I, I haven't had the opportunity to see this before, but as I understand it, that the invention of glasses or the introduction of glasses into Europe in, in the 13th century was probably seen as one of the most influential economic developments that Europe had seen because it prolonged the working life of artisans and therefore improved the economies of those uh, countries which were able to, to develop eyewear. Do you have a feel for the, the potential impact that this might have on the economy of the, of the third world? It will, have an, it, it will have an absolutely huge impact. Uh, it'll have um, bringing corrective eyewear to those that need it worldwide will have a huge impact on education, on quality of life, and actually on um, a poverty reduction. Um, and it will have a huge impact, which is why I sort of came back from retirement. Josh, thank you very much. I have to leave it there. We'll give you your eyeglasses back at the end of the session. But thank you very much indeed. That was fantastic. Our second presenter um, is Professor Robert Chambers. Well, wait for Josh to pick up his stuff. Are you all right? Uh, yeah, where do I go? If you go out this way, and there'll be a... Our second presenter is Professor Robert Chambers. Um, Robert is research associate at the Institute of Development Studies, Sussex. He describes himself as an undisciplined nomad. You'll see him in a minute, and maybe you'll agree, with development field experience mainly in East Africa and South Asia. Is, is Robert Chambers there? Here he comes. Bravo. Robert is going to tell us in eight minutes why he believes community-led total sanitation can transform the health and well-being of hundreds of millions of people by 2020. Over to you, Robert. <coughs> well, it's a pretty daring title. It, it took me three days of agonizing before I dared to put in hundreds of millions, but I've come to the conclusion that it's realistic. Um, <coughs> the idea here of <coughs> community-led total sanitation is that instead of doing things for people in rural areas, particularly in countries of the South, developing countries, um, that we facilitate their own analysis and they take their own action. <coughs> the BMJ in 2007 had a poll uh, the poll was for the um, most important medical advance of the past 150 years. Um, most of us will know that the biggest vote went to sanitation, uh, ahead of anesthesia and ahead of antibiotics. And as a result of sanitation and hygiene, we in the North are very, very largely free of a whole mass of fecally related diseases and infections that we used to have which we no longer have, so we don't even think about them. But if, you, if we think about countries in the south, the diarrheas get most attention, and there's this much quoted figure of 5,000 children a day dying of, of diarrheas. But besides that, there are many others. Ascaris worms, 1.5 billion people in our world uh, have got Ascaris parasites. Hookworm is 740 million, and hookworm is a horrible consumer of blood and leads to anemia. And then we've got liver fluke, 40 to 70 million. And then there's hepatitis, typhoid, schistosomiasis, polio, guardia, trachoma, and the zoonoses. There's an extraordinary number of these diseases, all of which can be stopped here 